Has it been a crazy week for all of you like it has been for me? What about just today? Ask the guys in the sound booth about craziness, right? Well, I'm excited to be here. Um, I have a message for you. Uh, as some of you may know, I was at a rise for three and a half months. It's a soul winning evangelism school. And I learned all kinds of really cool stuff there. And so I've got all kinds of sermon topics. But I had some people ask me, well, we want to know what you, what you actually learned. And so I thought, well, I could kind of give a brief summary or I could just pick a topic. And I decided to give you kind of a, a summary, just hit on a few points that I learned that you may already know, but it'll be good to hear again. And if you don't know it, maybe it'll spark a little more study or a little more thought. And that, that's kind of my hope for today. So I affectionately call this, what did I do on my fall break? It's kind of like when we went to school and we came back after summer break, your school teacher would say, tell us, write down what you did over fall, or your summer break. So here's what I did on my fall break. And as we get going, let's have a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you today humble. We come to you with open arms, with open hearts. Lord, we pray that you will open our ears and our minds. Lord, we pray that your message will come out clearly, that it will be a blessing to those that are here. Lord, we just thank you for another Sabbath. For me, it's been a crazy week. I'm sure there's people here that have had a crazy week as well. And so, Lord, as we rest from the day-to-day -day life, we just pray that you will bless us today. Be with us and let us have a wonderful Sabbath day together. In your name we pray. Amen. My first experience as, a, as an Adventist has been relatively short. I haven't even been baptized in the church for a year yet. But when I got baptized, I had made sure and I took an extra six months or so, just about six months, to really make sure I understood what our doctrine said, you know, the 28 fundamental beliefs, because I wanted to know what I was getting into. So I took my time with it, and I got baptized, and, and I immediately went out, and I would start sharing some of the things I learned. And of course, as we all know, the Sabbath is a big issue, a big subject. So I was like many people where, you know, maybe you've done it. Somebody asks you about the Sabbath, and what do we do? We blast them with text. Boom, 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 boom. Overload them. They kind of get a little shook up, if you will. Well, I did that. And what I realized when I went to Arise is I don't know, I really didn't know who God was. I was raised a Lutheran, and I can't honestly say, and I'm sure it was said, but I don't ever remember anybody mentioning God and love in the same sentence. I, I don't ever recall that. And to be honest with you, in my short term in the time in the Adventist church, I don't remember hearing that very often in the Adventist church until recently. Now, maybe I just wasn't paying attention, but my perception was that of what I think a lot of Christians have. God is out there to zap us. You mess up, psst, you're smite, you're, you're, you're shot down. But I learned that's not who God is. Arise helped bring that to light. Arise is a story, if, if you can read that. We go through the whole Bible, and they start... Pre-creation, creation, fall, Messiah, covenants, um, can't read the last one there, church, and then recreation. It's a story through the Bible. And they do it that way because that's what the Bible is. It's a story. It's a story of Christ. The people at Arise come from all over the world. We had people from Norway, from Venezuela, from Canada, from the U all across the U.S., we had Germans, we had a Switzerland guy who grew up mostly in Africa. So all these people came from around the world to learn and study about Jesus. And what was really cool, and I'm really glad to hear with Jack Cologne coming, what he has started, and we saw a little brief uh, example last Sabbath. Every morning, we had worship together. We'd sing a few songs, we'd break off into twos, have prayer with one another, then one of the students was assigned, and we'd get up and we'd give a daily devotion, about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'd have a group prayer, and we'd start our day. And I'll tell you what, sitting down in that small group to have prayer 
with one of your brothers or sisters is amazing. It is so awesome. And there's so many times where I woke up and I was up there and I was like, I don't want to do this right now. I am not in the mood to sit here and pray for somebody or have them pray for me. But you know what? I had to force myself those days, and those were the days that I had the greatest blessing. We had people, uh, a guy from uh, uh, Portugal, amazing story. For sake of time, I won't go into their individual stories, but we had another guy. He actually filled out his application. You have to fill out an application for a rise. He filled it out while he was in jail. He was into drugs. He was into bad stuff. His mom sent him the application. So as he's sitting in a jail cell, filling out the application, and he got accepted, he got there, and he was a great blessing to all of us. You know, those are the stories of people that are out there. People are looking for Christ. And we're going to touch on that a little bit more. So what I learned, if you'll turn with me to 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. This, this right here, to me, is the main point. If nothing else, I want you to get this out of today. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. When I first heard that, I about fell over. God is love? That's not what I was told. That's not what I believed. God is love. And that is the basis of everything we need to learn. God is love. And what's cool here is in this God is love, they use the word agape. In the Greek, there's actually about three different types of love. you got eros, which basically means uh, I love food. I love pizza. I love this tree. Okay, it's kind of a superficial love. Then there's phileo, more like a friendship love. I love you, man. Okay, phileo. But then there's agape, and agape is very lofty. Nothing had been attributed to or, or assigned agape until Jesus was on earth. Agape is a unilateral or a one-directional love. It's a love we really can't comprehend. We really can't understand the amount of love that God has for us. Our, our modern dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, has many definitions of love, but most of them are referring back to the eros and phileo. I love pizza, I love baseball, I love my buddy, I love my dog. And one definition gets down and it says unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another as the fatherly concern for humankind. Well, that's the closest we get. But we see this agape love when God is talking to Peter, and he's trying to restore him. He, and, and we heard this by John Pritchard, what, a month ago. Do you love me? Do you agape me? Peter's response was, God, you know I do. You know I phileo you. But do you love me? Do you agape me? Lord, I phileo you. And God, Jesus, excuse me, Jesus finally said, I understand. You phileo me. Okay, there's a difference there. And at the time, Peter knew there was a difference. And God knew there was a difference. This love that God has, it's hard to almost describe because it is, it's just so immense. It's so beautiful. That is what God has. See, God's love is other-centeredness. It's about you. It's about someone else. And the thing with that is, God cannot be a rigid singularity if it's about other-centeredness. You can't have other-centered love if it's just you. If I'm up here, I can't say, man, Ross, I really love you. That's not other-centered. That's selfish. So then you bring in another person, say my wife. Well, now we have a love for each other, but as oftentimes you see in a relationship, one party will shift a little bit towards the other. So it's not completely other-centered, because we're kind of shifting a little bit. You may notice that with me and Esther. You may notice it with you and a friend. So then it brings us to, it has to be three. Well, what do we know right off at the start is three. God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. 
he shows us right off the bat that he is other-centered love, that three, that trinity. That way they have that universal other-centered love going around them. And in Genesis, God creates the man and the woman, and he says, multiply, create your three. He tells us to duplicate what he has already done, and that is a beautiful love. Genesis 1 and 2 is, uh, it blew me away when I learned about Genesis 1 and 2. Really, everything in the Bible hinges on Genesis 1 and 2. If we're right about our belief in what Genesis 1 and 2 says, we're right about the whole Bible. But if we're wrong, we're wrong about the whole Bible. See, in Genesis 1 and 2, it basically answers all the questions. And it starts out, you know, we learn about the character of God, the Sabbath. We learn about health, time. We learn about relationships. We learn that God has our best interests at heart. We learn that he favors pleasure. Now, I'm not talking sexual pleasure. I'm talking pleasure. We're supposed to have pleasure in work. We're supposed to have pleasure in health. We're supposed to have pleasure in relationships. We're supposed to have pleasure in time. Our choices are supposed to be pleasurable. He wants us to have pleasure. He wants us to enjoy ourselves. That is part of his gift. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. God is Elohim. It is a plural form of God. So again, the first four words in, in the Bible tells us there's more than one God. We have the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We have other-centered love. That word Elohim, that's a, it's a personal introduction. When I introduce myself, I don't walk up and say, hi, I'm human. <laughs> I, don't walk, yeah, I don't walk up and say, hi, I'm an American. No, hi, I'm Ross. That's what God's doing. He's saying, hi, I'm God. I'm Elohim. This is me. It's that personal introduction. And so right off the bat, he wants that relationship. Right off the bat, he wants that love. Amen is right. Thank you. Creation. Well, let me go to the chiastic structure. We, all, we, we may know what that is. It's, it's a thing that's in the Bible many times. It's a writing style that uses repetition to make a point. And at the center of that point is the main point. Now, if I can get the switch to the next slide for me. We're, we're having some audiovisual issues this morning, so unfortunately you won't get all my slides and we'll make do with what we can do here, okay? This is a typical chiastic structure. A, A, B, B, C, C, and then D. A and A would be basically the same thing. So the top A might be the sky is blue. And then you're going to repeat it and say um, blue is the color of the sky. They're both basically saying the same thing. B might be the color of leaves are green. The bottom B might be the tree color, or the leaves on the trees are green. So they both basically say the same thing, just a little bit differently. The main point then might be colors are beautiful. Okay? That's just a simple example. We see it throughout the Bible. Okay? Chiastic structure is something that is important because it gives extra emphasis on a point. So, in creation, if we can switch to the next slide, Davide. He creates day one. He creates light. Day two, firmament, sky, um, sea. Day three, he creates land, vegetation. On day four, so he creates a space, day one, two, and three. Day four, then what does he do? He fills the light, the moon, the stars, the sun. Day five, he fills the space with birds, with fish. Day six, he fills the animals, or the land with animals, with humans, Adam and Eve. Day seven, it's a space. And what does he fill it with? Time with us, relationship. That space is to be filled with you and me, with God. When I first saw this, I thought, whoa, you got to be kidding me. He created a space for us to fill with him. You can't tell me the Sabbath is not important. This just blew my mind. And I could turn this into a Sabbath sermon, but we're going to try not to do that. 
The Sabbath is more than just a day. It's more, it, if we view it as just a day, we're just legalistic. And that's what I was doing when I first got baptized. Oh, the Sabbath, you know, here's a bunch of scriptures that you've got to go by. I missed the point. It's a relationship with God on a time that he set aside for us. He created a space for us to fill with him. That is beautiful. That is love. The first thing that is recorded in the Bible as holy is the Sabbath. Genesis 1, verse 1 through 23, mentions the first six days only once. Mentions the Sabbath three times. The Jews, when they would talk about something that is important, they would use exciting enthusiasm, but they would mention it how many times? Three. God mentions the Sabbath three times, right in creation. If you look at just the word, word-wise, if you look at the Ten Commandments, what's right in the middle? The Fourth Commandment about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is important. If you look at Isaiah 65, verse 17, it's the first promise of the new earth. Chapter 66, verse 22 and 23, qualifies it on what the new earth is. So again, the Sabbath becomes a big thing. It's, it's part of our new earth. Dr. Ron Dupree was one of our instructors. He's an amazing man. He's working on his third doctorate right now out of Andrews. And they're all on the Sabbath. His third doctorate is on one verse in the Bible. One verse. And he's already written a, a, his dissertation, whatever it is, about that thick, on one verse. Something he said, Sabbath is rest from, not just rest. It's rest from. And what he says is this, if you are so tired on the Sabbath that you can't enjoy it, then you've broken the Sabbath earlier in the week. Think about it. We're supposed to rest from our daily ventures, not just go home and sleep all day. So if, if we need to prepare for that Sabbath as the week is going on, and admittedly, I didn't do so well this week. I was up late last night finishing my sermon. But we have to prepare. The whole week is for prepare and be able to enjoy the Sabbath. Enjoy that space that God created for us. Enjoy that time with God. Now that might be here at church. It might be helping down at the, the soup kitchen. It might be helping someone who's whatever. But that is what we're supposed to do. That is what God is asking us to do. The Sabbath is amazing. And God's love is shown through the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a memorial of God's creation. It was Adam's first day of rest. The first six days, God worked. Work, 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 work. He creates Adam and Eve, and the first thing he says, rest. I can only imagine Adam saying, well, wait a minute, God, I haven't done anything. I don't need to rest. I haven't done anything. Adam, just rest. Spend time with me. Let's work on our relationship here. Let, let's get straight. First thing Adam had to do. Now, granted, he, he went ahead and named some animals, but first full day was the Sabbath. To me, that's pretty impressive. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. God created man, male and female. He created them. He tells us right off the bat. He created both of them. Then God blessed them. Now, here's the thing. Some of you may disagree with me. Um, God created man and woman. The two of them together is what completes humanity. The two of them together is the fullness of God's image. That's the beauty of it. Now, that doesn't mean if we're single that you're not in God's image. It doesn't mean that. But God's ideal, he has an ideal. He's got a perfect picture that he wanted that unfortunately got disrupted when sin entered the world. But that is his perfect picture. Man and woman together as one is the perfect image of Christ. And then go and multiply. I think that's cool. Maybe, maybe you don't. I think that's pretty fantastic. Thank you. All right. Genesis chapter 1 through 11 covers 2,000 years. Over 2,000 years, and he talks, you know, it, it, it's like Moses is just going through it real fast. Oh, i got to hurry and get through this. Get to the point. Get to the point. He just 2,000 years. He hits chapter 12. 
12 through 50, and it covers 100 years. Why? Have you thought about it? Why does, God, or why does Moses race through 2,000 years in 12 cha or 11 chapters to only hit the brakes? What happened? That was Abraham. That's when Abraham came into the picture. God's covenant, his agreement, his contract with Abraham, he does his part, Abraham does his part. That was the first one where man actually really upheld it. He really held to it. God made many covenants starting in Genesis 1 and 2, but none were truly upheld. All scripture points to Jesus. All scripture. And all scripture is built around the covenant God had with Abraham. God has always said, I will do whatever. I will do blah, blah, blah. You do your part. And man has always failed, continues to fail. Well, Abraham was holding up to it. See, people will say, well, that's old covenant, that's new covenant. Well, I'm going to argue that new covenant has been around the whole time as well. Because the new covenant is about what's inside your heart. It's about God being within your heart. See, when God says, I'm going to do this, all we have to do is say, I believe you. That's our part. I believe you. I have faith in you. You've been faithful all along. I have faith. That's our part. God's going to do all the other work. We just got to put it in his hands. See, we do things because we love someone. I do things for my wife that I may not like to do, but it makes her life easier. It gives her some pleasure. It gives her a feeling of maybe some relief. So I do that. If you love God, we want to do things. We want to follow the Ten Commandments. We want to do things that will please Him. We want Him, or hope that He is going to be able to say to us, I'm well pleased. Right? But it's out of love. It's not that we have to. And that's something you got to think about. Old Covenant was, uh, I have to. New Covenant is, I want to. And I think there's a difference. I think there's a big difference there. See, God had such, or Abraham had such belief in God, he was willing to sacrifice his son. But at the same time, he knew he wouldn't have to. Now, I got a whole other sermon on that, but we'll just leave it at that. Uh, Abraham knew right off the bat he wasn't going to have to sacrifice Isaac. But he was following through with what God had asked him to do because that's what he was doing to please God. The Old Covenant, as we see in Exodus 20, basically the Israelites will say, hey, we'll do whatever he says. We'll do whatever God Just don't let him come near us again. He scares us. He's, we're afraid of him. We'll just do it. So they were trying to follow the covenant, not because of their heart. They were just trying to do it because they were afraid of the rules. They, they, they wanted to abide by the rules. Well, they were physically conforming but they were deficient in the heart and soul. And they failed. The new covenant is that obedience that springs forth from within, from within God that taking hold of our heart and doing what is pleasing for him. Because again, it's all about love. That vital thing, God is love. We see, we see that new, uh, new covenant experience with Daniel. We see it throughout the, the Old Testament, but Daniel is one of them. It's a pretty big, uh, pretty big name in the Bible. Well, he had that new covenant experience. We are to live in a covenantal faith in God's promises. Now, here, listen closely. We are saved by the faithfulness of God to his covenant and our faith in Jesus. See, a lot of times we say, oh, it's our, you know, faith of God. Well, his faith has never been questioned. It's his faithfulness and our faith in him. There's a difference. His faithfulness. He's always faithful. He's always going to come through with what he says. There's no question there. We just have to have faith in Jesus. Another way you could say it is faithfulness of Christ in us. We just have to do what he asks. We just have to believe. That's what he asks. I think 
We say it's simple enough, but is it? I mean, it's pretty hard to do. You know, if we start moving forward into the more of the New Testament stuff, one of the things that I learned that I thought was pretty fascinating was a little bit more about the great lie, the great controversy, if you will. See, Satan, or at the time, Lucifer, when he was up in heaven and he started his rebellion, he was trying to attack God's character to get people to sway their thoughts. And eventually he got cast down. He, he claimed earth as his dominion. And if you look at Isaiah chapter 14, go ahead and turn there with me. Isaiah 14, and, and we've gone over this before, but there's something I want you to see. Isaiah 14, uh, verse 13. You're going to see that, that chiastic structure here again. Verse 13, for I have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now, of course, this is uh, Satan. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like most high. There's five I will statements there. This, this is Satan trying to put himself first. And right in the middle, I will sit on the mount of the congregation. Well, what is that? That's Christ's throne. He wants to sit on Christ's throne overseeing the universe. He wants all of us to worship him. And he's trying to get us there by attacking God's character. But the ultimate point is power and worship. Satan wants to be worshipped. He doesn't want us to worship our creator. And that's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. If you go to Matthew 4, verses 1 through 9, we all know this, I hope. Uh, Jesus is in the wilderness. He gets tempted. And on the last temptation, verse 9, what happens? Satan says, all these things I will give you if you fall down and have lunch with me. No. All these things I'll give you if you fall down and sunbathe with me. No. Worship me. All these things I'll give you if you worship me. He wants us to worship him. He wants Jesus to worship him. Thankfully, Jesus was able to withhold the temptation. But that is where the great lie is. That is what, what it's all about, is worship. We see it again in Revelation. But this is new to me. I didn't know it was about worship. I just thought it was this character thing. Well, he's using the character to get us to worship him. He's trying to prove that God is not who he says he is. Luke 8, 26 through 28, the demon-possessed demon, pe demon man. Even the demon-possessed man, in verse 28, I beg you, do not torment me. He's afraid of the lie. He's bought into the lie. He's afraid God's going to torment him, or Jesus will torment him. That's not his character. That's not the love of Christ. But he is bought into that lie. Does that make sense? Revelation chapter 13 and 14. In those two chapters, eight times worship is mentioned. Seven of those times, it's worship the beast, worship the dragon, worship Satan, worship the image of the beast. Only one time, and this is Revelation 14 verse 7, only one time is the true call to worship mentioned. And he says, worship God. Worship God is the true call. But again, Satan is trying to get us to worship him. That is the lie. That is what we have to be aware of. See, God gives us free choice. God gives us that free choice, that free will. And all he does is answer what we ask for with our hearts. There's definitely a time where, where our choices are going to be judged, right? God will give us up to Satan if that's what we're worshiping. But he will keep fighting for us as long as we keep trying to worship him, as long as we keep opening ourselves up to him. So a judgment, right? There's a judgment coming. God knows everything, so why do we need a judgment? Reasonable question. If he really knows everything, why does he need to judge us? Well, free choices have to be finalized. At some point in time, they have to be finalized. See, God examines evidence before he makes his judgment. There's several instances in the Bible. He knows the answer, 
but because he wants to instill or inspire confidence in us, he wants us to, to see his leadership and his, and his true justice. He investigates. Genesis 4.9, Cain and Abel. Cain, where's your brother? Well, he knew where the brother was. This is the first murder recorded in the Bible. But he came down to investigate. Before the flood, Genesis 6, God saw man was wicked. I can almost imagine him getting that phone call. Hey, God, you got to come check this out. These guys are wicked. No, that can't be. We've already talked to them. But he comes and he checks it out. He sees for his own eyes. Yeah, they're wicked. Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. Lord came down to see. Are these guys really building that tower? I mean, I told them it wasn't, the flood wasn't going to happen again. Are they really doing that? Well, he already knows the answer. But he comes to see. He comes to investigate so that we can have confidence in him. See, God cares because he's on trial. Did you know that? Did you guys know God was on trial? He's on trial because he's been misrepresented. So he's, in a sense, clearing his name as well. He's showing us his love because he's on trial. That, to me, uh, God's on trial? Why would he be on trial? But he is. Satan is the accuser according to the Bible. The Bible is a story that is trying to demonstrate that God is not that which he's been accused of. That is a huge story in itself. He's always trying to be fair. In Ephesians, we learn that God's using our, our planet to vindicate that. He's using it. We're basically on center stage, and the whole universe is watching us. In 1 Peter, the angels are concerned about how this plays out, because one, it all originated in their backyard, and two, the Bible says, we're going to be their neighbors someday. They, they have an interest. What's going on down here? See, God is using our planet to, to show his mercy, his love, his justice. If we open to uh, Revelation 22, will you turn there with me? Revelation 22. All right. Revelation 22, verse 11. In the end, there's going to be two classes of people. Okay? Revelation 22, verse 11. He who is just, let him be unjust still. I'm sorry. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Two classes of people. The first class, the, the, the righteous class, are going to be able to say to God, your will be done. Your will be done. The second class, God is going to have to say to them, your will be done. See, if we're following Christ, if we have Christ in our heart and we're loving Christ, his will will be done. We follow what Christ asks. But those that are worshiping Satan, those that aren't following Christ, he's going to honor that too. Your will will be done. You, you want that? You want to follow all that stuff? It's yours. So really, judgment itself is it, not a scary thing. Judgment should be easy. Judgment should be something that we go into already knowing the answer. We shouldn't be sitting there biting our nails and sweating bullets. What we need to be worried about, though, is what decisions are we making today? The decisions we're making today are what's going to affect that judgment. The decisions we make today are going to affect whether or not we tell God your will is be done or he tells us our will will be done. Do you see the difference? All God does at judgment is acknowledge our decisions. That's all he does. Judgment should be easy. So, so let's get there. How, how do we get there? How do we get to that point then where we can say your will be done? Well, one of the first things that we can get into, discipleship. I'm excited about Jack Cologne. I, when I heard him last week, I was really excited because a lot of the stuff he says is what we did at Arise. 
Obviously, he's got many years of experience. He's got a great plan. If you weren't here, you missed out, but you're going to learn about desert rain. And I'm going to put my little plug in right now. He says eight weeks out, we should get together, do our little 20-minute deal before Sabbath school starts. I think we should do it every Sabbath. I think every Sabbath before it starts, we should get together in pairs and just pray. At Arise, what we did is, you know, there's 40 students plus some instructors. We would, we, we would say, okay, break off into twos and pray. Find someone you haven't prayed with before. What better way for us to get to know our own church members than to pray with them? One-on-one. -on -one. Hey, what can I pray for you for today? Uh, you know, I had a rough day at work. I had a rough week at work. Uh, what about you? Oh, you know, I just found out my sister's got cancer. How beautiful is it to sit down and have that one-on-one -on -one prayer with our feather, fellow brother and sister? That is beautiful. So I, I hope, and this, this is my plea, so those that are here, I hope we do it all the time. I think we should start it out all the time that way. So part of Jack Cologne's thing in Desert Rain is getting out into the community, right? That's part of discipleship. That's what we're called to do. Well, let me tell you from firsthand, one, it's scary. It really is. When you first start, it's scary. But I'll tell you what, the blessings are abundant. Every time we had to go out into the community at Arise, the mood in the room, we'd gather up, we'd have prayer and stuff. The mood in the room was, I really don't want to do this. I'm not feeling it. But I'll tell you what, as soon as you get out there and you start talking to the community, it changes your life. There are so many people out in the community, out in the world, who are begging for someone to knock on their door and introduce them to God's love. Amen. We just have to get out there and do it. They are waiting. They are pleading. There's so many stories. Just in the, the three and a half months that we had at Arise, there were so many stories of people going out in our class and just meeting people who are just desperate. And the amazing thing is, is you might be having a horrible day, but you get out there and you give your last little prayer and say, Lord, I'm coming up to this house and it's been a rough day, but Lord, just please let them welcome me. And you know what? One of the first things that they'll do when they open the door, I was just praying about this. I was just thinking about I, I want to go to church. I was just wondering about God. Jack Cologne gave us a story about it also. It's absolutely amazing how the Spirit works in that regard. And not one day did we come back from outreach that somebody, if not multiple people, had beautiful stories like that. You want to talk about changing the world, that's the way to do it. Discipleship, right? I know Pastor Jonathan is big on discipleship. I know this church is moving that way, and we've got a great thing with Jack Cologne coming. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end. God tells us, go. Go. The Spirit will be with you. Go out into the community. The Spirit, I will be with you. And my promise is, I will be with you always. You will have my continual presence. But go. Don't just sit around. In Matthew 8, and again in Luke 9, talks about discipleship. It's not easy. It's scary. It's not comfortable. Jesus told the disciples. He was right up front with them. And I'm telling you this too. When we go out and we share the gospel, we share Jesus' love, it's uncomfortable. It's a little bit uneasy. Some people get mad. We get doors slammed in our face. We get swear words thrown at us. But that one person who says, praise God, I was just about to go kill myself. Praise God, I was about to leave my wife. Praise God, I was whatever. Fill in the blank. It's all worth it. It's not easy. You know, in Luke chapter 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan, again, I have a whole study on this, and when I heard this, it was pretty amazing for me. And that's why I want to share just a brief overview with you guys. You know, when I heard the Good Samaritan story, I always, you know, pictured, oh, I'm the Good Samaritan. I would help somebody in need. You know, the first people just ignore it, and they're busy with their daily life. But I would stop. I'm the Good Samaritan. Wrong. You know who I am? You know where discipleship starts? with recognition that I'm the guy that's been robbed and beaten. I'm the guy on the side of the road right now who's crying for help. So who's the Good Samaritan? Jesus. 
Jesus is the one that comes. And that's what people in the community are doing right now. They're lying there. They're broke. They're hurt. They're crying out for help. And Jesus is the Samaritan who's going to help them. So where does that put us? Who are we supposed to be then? Any ideas? Can't hear you. We're supposed to be like Jesus. I'm going to suggest we're supposed to be the innkeeper. See, the person that is broken, who's crying out for help, Jesus, the Samaritan, helps him, takes him to the innkeeper. What's the innkeeper do? He houses him. He feeds him. He nourishes him. He nurtures him. We, we, we can be the innkeeper. When those people come to our church, when those people start to see God's love, we need to be the innkeeper. We need to nurture them. We need to show them. We need to comfort them. Food for thought. Like I said, I have a whole thing on it that goes into more depth. But God, keep God's people safe. Heal them. Minister to them. Show them God. Be like Jesus. But we can be that innkeeper. You know, Revelation, the end of Revelation 19, verse 10, it says, Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Throughout the Bible, there, there's been prophets and prophecy. God will, will send a prophet. He'll share a message. That prophecy will then be fulfilled down the road. You get a prophet who shares a message, the prophecy gets fulfilled. Daniel and Revelation are two prophetic books. They're given to us. We've got the prophet. We've got the message. We're waiting for that to come through, right? That's where we're at now. So receiving a prophecy doesn't make us a prophet. So don't confuse that. See, there's a way to test the prophets. The Bible gives us a way to test if you're a true prophet or not. But we can have the spirit of prophecy if we share the testimony of Jesus. We get out and share God's love. And we can have that spirit of prophecy. We can share that love, that testimony of Jesus. Bring them in. Bring people in. If we look at Revelation 22, verse 14 and 17. Verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, and they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. Verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. We're the bride. Let us say come. Let us tell people to come. And then they can tell people to come. And we can all drink freely of the water of life. Salvation is free. We can't earn it. Right? But we can go out and do what God has asked us. We can go and, and baptize and, and preach and, and teach all in the name of Jesus. We can share that message. We can show God's love. There's a way to do it, and I can't wait to see Jesus when that happens. I can't wait for us to be in that position. You know, incidentally, does anybody know what the first three words in the Conflict of the Ages series are? Anybody? God is love. What are the last three words? God is love. If nothing else, I hope you'll take from this. God is love. He loves us so much, we can't comprehend it. He loves us so much, he gave his only son for us. God is love. I'm going to do something a little different today. We're going to do a quick closing prayer. But instead of going down to the, to the back of the room, I'm going to hang out up here for a few minutes. If anybody has something that they'd like to pray over or to pray about, come on up and we'll have a quick prayer. If not, we'll see you at potluck. Amen? Amen. All right. Father in heaven, I just thank you for today, for your Sabbath, for your love that you have shown us all throughout the history of creation, and the love that you continue to show us until the end of time. Lord, we just pray that we can, can honor you, have our faith in you, that you, you, you know what's best. Lord, just help us to, to keep that faith. Help us to do as you have asked, not, out of, not because we have to, because we want to, because we love you, because we want to be pleasing for you. 
we want that, not we have to. God, you have told us to go out, get into the community, share your, your testimony, share it with those who are in need, and we know there are people out there who are desperately seeking you. Lord, give us the strength and the ability, give us the power, give us the, the, the energy, give us the, the Holy Spirit through us that we can do that. And Lord, we know that in the time where somebody is questioning you, we know that you will give us the words to say. We know that you will show us how to act. We just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the Sabbath day and for our friends, for our family. We thank you for our fellowship here. Lord, as we continue into Sabbath and start our new week, we just pray that you will continue, continue your love and continue to show it to us each and every day, even on a cold, windy day, on a sunny, bright day. Your love is everywhere. We just need to stop and smell the roses. Lord, thank you for loving us. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen.